Lakeland Public Television presents Currents. Hello, and welcome to Lakeland Currents. I'm Bethany Wesley. It's now summertime here in the Northwoods, which means droves of tourists and residents alike have been heading to area lakes to fish and recreate out on the water. But these days, a trip to the lake frequently includes a visit with a local watercraft inspector, someone tasked with keeping an eye out for unwanted hitchhikers that could further spread aquatic invasive species throughout Minnesota's waterways. According to the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, about 5% of Minnesota's lakes are listed as infested with invasive species. And that number is growing. In August 2016, for example, starry stonewort was found at the Big Turtle Lake boat access in Beltrami County. In June, the DNR reported the first new confirmation of zebra mussels in a Minnesota lake in 2017, when an adult zebra mussel was found in Cedar Lake in Wright County. But what exactly does it mean when aquatic invasive species are found? And is there anything that can be done to eradicate them? To answer these questions, and many more, I welcome to the program Nicole Kovar, an invasive species specialist with the Minnesota DNR. Hi welcome. There. Thank you. Nice to be here. As we get started first, let's talk about generally what exactly aquatic invasive species are. How are they different than just a non-native species? Um, well, an invasive species is, like you said, a non-native species, but for some reason they cause a problem. So that's the key in that definition. They cause a problem, whether that's an economic problem, a societal problem to society, or uh, an environmental problem, something that we're dealing with aquatics, so a problem to the lake itself. So that's um, the two parts there, non-native and causes a problem. And they're both plants and animals, they can be either. It can be a plant or an animal, and in fact, um, and it could also be a, a virus, and uh, within the animal category falls fishes and things of that nature, so. Generally speaking, like how many aquatic invasive species are there that are on your radar that you keep an eye open for? Oh goodness, on the radar, so not in Minnesota. Oh, in Minnesota. Yeah. Let's, let's um, in, Minnesota. <laughs> we have, yeah, we have those two sides. We have on the horizon, <laughs> which we don't have yet, and we have the ones that we do have. Okay. Um, so in general, um, there would be, you know, the, the biggest ones that we put on the designated infested waters list being faucet snail, uh, zebra mussel, spiny water flea, Eurasia water milfoil, um, we do have uh, starry stonewort now, which is an algae, not, not a plant. Um, so those are the uh, biggest ones um, in our area. There's also others, um, and we'll talk about, if you want, a prohibited classification and a regulated classification. Some of those are some of the prohibited. And then for regulated species, we have things as like mystery snails, banded mystery snails, rusty crayfish, curly leaf pineweed. So there are quite a number of aquatic invasive species in our state. Um, and there are others that we don't, don't want either um, on the horizon and other states have. So. We know that there are some new ones. You used to talk about them that are on the horizon that could come. Some that are relatively new, like starry stonewort, but they've been around for a while, right? I mean, AIS isn't anything new. I mean, they've, they've been coming here for time. Oh, right. Um, in fact, there are, um, sorry, Stonewart, we just had the first infestation in 2000, um, let's see, I gotta get my years right, 2015 in Minnesota, down in uh, Lake Coronas. Well, actually, in the United States, Starry Stonewall was first um, documented in 1978 in the St. Lawrence Seaway. And actually, when they look back to herbarium samples, 1974 was the earliest. So if you think of it in that perspective, um, as the United States, we've been dealing with invasive species for quite some time. Curly leaf pondweed has been in uh, Minnesota for over 100 years. Okay. Um, so it's, it's been here, um, just new ones come in, and uh, we're now realizing the impacts of these species that have come in earlier. We're just realizing those impacts now and how important it is to stop any spread. Fair to say it can take years sometimes to see some of the effects that an AIS can have. It could, and it also takes many years to do research on them and study them, compile enough data to understand them as well. So. 
So you talk about the ones that are on the horizon. I'm assuming are those places that you've seen, you've <coughs> seen them in other places that could come to Minnesota. How do they get here? The major route of transport is human activity, okay. unfortunately. Um, it, the, analyzing the um, infestations across the United States and across Minnesota, fishes, yes, can travel upstream, um, but the infestations follow highways, um, if you would. Um, the greatest use lakes um, were getting infested first, so you can see like spokes of a wheel to the the highest use okay. lakes and then along the highway corridors. So okay. the, the greatest risk is ourselves um, spreading it around. Okay. Are there certain are there certain geographical locations that a certain species will do better? Like when you look at the region that you represent, is that do you focus on a different AIS than perhaps somebody might in southeastern Minnesota or are they pretty much the same throughout the state? Well I wouldn't look at geographical region. Um, more than I would look at, say, um, specific lake conditions. Mm -hmm. So different lake conditions um, will be more suitable for a species than another. And there's been risk assessments done by um, different entities to look at the composition, the chemical composition of the lake and the lake water and the nutrients available to look at, say, for example, zebra mussels, how well they could do in different lakes. And calcium is their limiting factor, and so if there isn't a lot of calcium in a lake, uh, zebra mussels can't grow um, a shell, so there isn't enough for a high population to grow a shell. So I'd look more at those characteristics than geographic location. Are there some AAS that are more dangerous, that are more threatening, perhaps would be a better word? Like a homeowner would certainly not, or a property owner would be upset to hear about a certain one more so than others. Are there more dangerous ones? Well, um, I don't know if dangerous is what I would use, but I think that they're scarier to people um, based on information that they've heard or, or um, things they've seen happen in, in other lakes and other places. Zebra mussels is very scary for people. Um, there's um, information out there that talk about the uh, property values of a home on a lake that has zebra mussels and things like that. And I would say that one would, would probably be um, that species, you know, that everyone's the zebra mussels talking about. And that and now starry stonewort is so new to our lake and we don't know a lot about starry stonewort because there hasn't been a lot of research on starry stonewort in the past um, so that's very scary we don't know how it will react in our lakes and and actually a species could react very differently in different lakes um, so it, it's unknown and, and we are all afraid of the unknown right so I would say that's those two are probably okay. we have a handle on um, species like Eurasian water milfoil um, how to treat how to control if an infestation has happened, how to control them with okay. treatment. So um, that's, to me, less, less scary. I can uh, get a handle on that one. I want to talk a little bit as we move forward and talk specifically about the, some of the AIS coming, but talk about your role. What is it that you do then? What is an AIS specialist? What what is it your job duties? Well, um, as a, a program as a whole, you know, we um, were created to prevent the spread of invasive species across Minnesota, prevent any new infestations of any new in species into Minnesota, and then minimize the impacts that those species cause to us. Um, so my job up here, so I'm specific to Region 1, and the regions are split into two districts. So I'm in the North District of Region 1. So basically, um, Wadena County line, Cass County line up to the borders, okay. um, all of those counties. And I uh, work on our goals within um, my district and our region. So prevent the spread around Minnesota, uh, prevent any new and minimize impact. Um, so we work on permitting. There's a permitting system out there for lake associations that do have infestation. Um, like I said, get a control um, and management of that species within their lake. Also a lot of education um, during the downtime or off season in the winter and fall, there's a lot of going on of, of um, presentations and conferences and seminars and water festivals and um, even a request from um, an elementary school um, we go to. So a lot of that going on and then um, also this time of the year is when we start doing um, 
following up on reports. So we're looking for new infestations. We want to find them as quickly as possible in order to contain them at the point of infestation. So if a person becomes aware that that lake that they're visiting has something, then they could be even more diligent on what they're supposed to do. So the rest of my summer will, will most likely be a lot of that. Um, and then uh, looking at starry stonewort and treatment options and, and okay. things like that. So Interesting. I want to touch on those two that we've kind of hit on a little bit, but I just want to kind of focus on them a little bit more, um, starting with the zebra mussels <coughs> themselves. Because we know that they are in various lakes in this region. We know that they're, right, correct me if I'm wrong, Cass Lake, Beach Lake. Cass. Um, Cass has a verified adult population. Um, there were other lakes um, designated infested precautionary because of their connectivity. To and that means Cass. that they're found in a lake or a waterway that's connected, right? Right. And the, the water bodies around Cass Lake are highly connected and navigable, and okay. there's movement between them. Um, we have had some verification of adults in those connected, uh, a few of those connected waters, okay. not all. Um, Leech Lake was found with villagers last, well, the samples were taken in the summer as part of our large lake program and fisheries department and analyzed later on in the fall um, when workload permitted. And, and villagers are? Villagers are a juvenile form of, of the zebra mussel. Tiny. So the baby yep. zebra mussel, microscopic. Yep. Um, so. Um, those two we have around a um, direct vicinity, and then Detroit Lakes. You know, it, to where I'm in in Park Rapids, you know, Cass is just as far as Detroit Lakes. So I bring that up too. There are very um, quite a few lakes in that mm -hmm. area that have uh, zebra mussel con confirmation. What is it about the zebra mussel that is threatening or that is concerning? What does it do? Um, well, the zebra mussel um, itself can for the impact to the environment. Um, it can filter out that necessary part of the food chain that our natives need to survive. So that lower part of the food chain um, with plankton, um, so the zooplankton, it's it taking, removing from the um, food web and the phytoplankton, it's filtering that, it ejects, you know, nothing that anything, uh, nothing wants to eat. Nothing and then um, it, it's removing things that say, our native mussels need to eat, even larval fishes need to eat that smaller um, part oh. of the food web. So it's removing okay. that. And then also to humans, it can uh, foul equipment. It can in, get into the intakes and motors and, and basically ruin a motor. Um, the shells are very sharp when broken um, and like a shard of glass when, when weight supplied to them could puncture a, a foot for sure. Yeah, because you've heard people who said if they swim where they are, water shoes or something to protect the bottoms of your oh, yeah. feet. Oh yep. yeah. And you know to feel them I'd say they're about the thickness of your of a fingernail just to okay. feel. Yep. Um, but if you put all your weight down on that uh, and, and it had an angle on it you definitely could cut yourself. Um, so there's that problem to beaches and things like that and then um, really to ec the economy and tourism you know that op is another um, whole um, issue there. Um, if a, a municipal uh, municipality is taking water from a, a zebra mussel infested source, they have the issue of cleaning out their um, lines you know, if it gets fouled up with zebra mussels and costs millions and millions of dollars um, to do that. Okay. So there's a huge economic issue as well. And then turning our attention to the, when we've talked about it a little bit here, but starry stonewort, which is one of the newer ones mm -hmm. to Minnesota. Um, what is it about that one in particular that is threatening or what does it do that is cause to pay attention to it? Um, well, like other um, aquatic invasive plants, there's the possibility that it could displace natives. So it could um, colonize a certain area and then no other plants could grow. And the importance is to uh, keep diversity. When you start to decrease diversity, you start to um, increase the system's inability to um, buffer itself, to adapt um, to new things. I, I liken it to, say, um, a forest of all one species of you know, the oak. An oak will comes in and, and kills all the oak. You have no forest left. So when you have a multitude of different species, um, it can buffer itself against those you know, environmental conditions, if you will. Um, so there's that. 
And then there's some anecdotal evidence out there that when it, um, it does colonize areas, it is areas uh, where fish like to spawn and have their beds. Okay. So it could cover up you know, spawning beds. Whether or not that causes some decrease in the fish population as a whole, we don't know that because there isn't enough research on that you know, very one okay. specific topic. So there's possibilities and also the impact on recreation. So plants such as Eurasian water milfoil and even curly leaf pondweed, they go, grow to the surface and cause such mats that uh, motors can't get through. It you know, wraps up on the pr propeller um, and um, pr pretty much ruins fishing if you can't put your line in, you're getting weeds. Yeah. Swimming is difficult if you're you know, getting caught up in weeds, uh, mm -hmm. plants. Uh, actually, we, I tend to stay away from the use of um, weed because I think of it as a dandelion in, in your yard. Um, plant, aquatic plants um, are good, and we, we need aquatic plants for the center of our ecosystem. Um, but if it's something you don't want, that's when people start using that <laughs> word weed. Um, so it's, uh, that's a, a major thing to us as humans, that um, recreational impact that a plant could cause. So sorry, stonewort, it mats much um, taller okay. than our native caras because we do have Cariaceae species in our state, and this is part of that family. Okay. Um, so it likes that same habitat, but it can grow much taller and denser. Um, so in shallows, um, and we've seen it from one to um, ten feet, and that it can grow up to that oh. um, depth, okay. um, whereas our natives would stay shorter at two to three feet. Okay. Um, so it's really a, an issue when you have um, that amount of matting up to the surface. Does it grow quickly? Um, I, and again, not a lot is known. Um, I've watched the plant for two months, or I keep saying plant there. It, it is an algae. Um, sorry, stone order is a macroalgae. So it looks like a, a vascular plant, okay. but it's actually a, um, a combination of cells. So individual cells connected to each other. Um, and it's, you know, just like a planktonic algae or blue green, those are very small algae. This is actually big enough, to, a macroalgae, where we can see with it. Uh, each cell with a naked eye. But it looks like a plant. It looks like a grassy plant. And I'll, I'll say plant a lot because, you know, it's a <laughs> uh, common name, I guess. Um, so um, the, uh, not much is known about it, but last year when it came into our region, you know, I watched it through those two months. And we're starting to watch it now that it started growing again. Um, we started watching it in June. Mm -hmm. And again, it's going to ma um, depend on environmental conditions, how fast it might grow, nutrient available in whichever lake, um, a, a number of things on how fast it grows. Even our own climate, you know, precipitation patterns or light availability could influence how fast it grows. Um, but when it does get going, it grows uh, well, <laughs> let's say, uh, because it starts to create cells and then uh, every one of those cells can create another cell off it. So when you start with one, you know, you multiply and you have two, but then it uh, increases exponentially, exponentially okay. the higher you go. Is that what the benefit is then in trying to catch AIS early? Is that there's hopefully less of it? Um, well, I would definitely say that's an important piece of um, early detection. Um, the, the sooner you can detect it and get a handle on it, the less of it you're going to have to deal with. Okay. Um, and, you know, that's true for starry stonewort, and that would be true. Um, Eurasian water milfoil is a prime example. We had a lake last year, um, just found it in their lake, and immediately um, got on it and started to look at chemical treatment of that oh. infestation in order to keep it at a, a, a manageable size because the, the more it is, the less likely it is to be able to treat it all um, oh. or get a handle on it the more there's left to spread and create new infestations around that lake. Okay. So if we could keep it at one acre instead of getting to 250 acres before we start thinking about um, what to do about it, you That's know, right. would be more cost effective <laughs> and, you know, much easier to control. So when, an, uh, when, a, when a body of water is, is identified to have a new AIS in it, is the goal always going to be to eradicate? I mean, are there treatments that have proven effective to the point where eradication is potentially an option? 
Um, unfortunately, there is no case study um, proven to eradicate uh, an aquatic invasive species from a lake once it has been infested. Okay. Our hope, I mean, I would hope that um, at any time that we could eradicate. And we're not going to stop trying if a new species comes in. And we'll give it that try and once we realize um, that what we um, had, tr you know, uh, tried through the, attempted, attempted thank you very much, um, attempted uh, wasn't the best avenue, um, then either we'd step back and look for more options um, and maybe maybe we combined all our options, maybe we used the best option we thought there was out there at the time. Um, so if oh. that wasn't so um, successful in eradication, you know, you'd step back, you'd take a look. And also you'd look at how many lakes have that infestation. And we can liken that to um, talk about Starry Stonewall in Big Turtle Lake being that it was the second lake found, um, it, well, Coronas, mud is connected to Coronas, so technically okay. the third, sure. but the second in, in so um, great a distance from Coronas, so the second lake in Minnesota found the Starry Stonewort. We had to attempt something to get it out of there because we found it at 0.75 acres. Okay. And we do a, a survey around the lake to determine if it's localized. And so at that point, you know, it's, you know, there's that slim chance it's possible. You gotta try. You gotta try. You can't not try um, to do that. So what was the steps that was taken, or what were the steps that were taken? Well, at that time, um, and our Beltrami County AIS coordinator um, had found the infestation there at Big Turtle Lake, and, mm -hmm. and we work in very close partnerships, the counties and um, everybody involved, um, really. I am in direct communication most of the times with, with our neighboring counties as well. And so he immediately texted and a picture was attached. And at that point, it get, um, triggers our ready response plan. Okay. And what that is, is our um, response, I don't want to say reaction, but response to a possible infestation. And, and it is immediate identification and then um, determining whether the infestation is localized or uh, lake-wide has spread around the lake. And with that involves um, meander surveys around the littoral zone of the lake where plants might grow to determine if we can find any more. Um, once we found it's localized, which we did there at Big Turtle, um, then we can start to talk about treatment options. Okay. So through the whole process, um, there's communication going on uh, behind the scenes, you know, um, emails back and forth, um, research being collected um, from Michigan, who's been dealing with this um, species for 10 years or more, Wisconsin, New York, um, so other places, what they've tried, what worked best, experts around the country and even in Europe, um, where Starry Stonewort is a native species over in Europe. Um, so there's all that gathering of information until we can formulate some type of um, treatment. Okay moving forward. All right. Uh, I want to focus a little bit back up just a second. You talked about some of the partners. There's a lot of different roles, a lot of different people that kind of keep eyes out, help fight AIS, raise public awareness. <coughs> Take us through some of those and how you guys are always communicating because you have the DNR, mm -hmm. you have watersheds, lake associations, and now county AIS specialists as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure I'm leaving out dozens other my apologies <laughs> fill me right, in right. who else am i missing well it, and it will depend on what what lake what project yeah. what area what county um so that it could be a number of different ones um and to give an example because it's easiest to give an example and big turtle seems to be working well um so there are uh, there's the watershed association so there's the turtle river watershed association they would become a partner the county because it's in their county landowner involved which actually it was at the access, so the landowner um, was our department, oh, okay. um, and it was a different division, but our department. Mm -hmm. It could even be, if it was federal land, could be um, whichever portion of the federal government mm -hmm. owns that land. Um, if it's tribal land, it would be the um, tribe that owns that land there, too. So it just would depend um, where. If there is a lake that has a lake association, then the lake association gets involved. Um, so the number, it could vary and be very different. But it, it must happen quickly, though, in terms of everybody gets involved. Because you said in Big Turtle Lake that um, the Beltrami County AAS individual was the one who located it, correct? Mm -hmm. But yep. you were alerted to that pretty quickly on then. 
oh, within, you know, I'm sure. <laughs> moments. <laughs> moments. Uh, you know how cell phones are now. It, it's immediate. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was, and then we found, you know, it's not just Big Turtle in Beltrami County that has it. So I remember being at the access of Big Turtle dealing with that response, and I believe we were putting in barriers that day, and um, the ARS um, coordinator through Beltrami County was still looking, and as part of our roles too, uh, and we can skip back to that, as part of our roles, he was looking for more. Um, mm -hmm. You know, where now should we check other accesses down the watershed, um, high use lakes, and I remember standing there getting another text from, from Bruce with with another infestation of starry stonewort. Uh -huh. So it is immediate. Uh -huh. um, and to, back to the partnerships, so um, it, de it, it will depend too on which project, who is taking the lead. Um, so there's all this technical um, expertise out there, and but I don't necessarily have the expertise in, in connecting with all the um, landowners or the local um, portion oh. of that. Sure. Um, because I deal with you know, our county has 21 regions, and I have, I think there's 12 in our district. Um, so I'm dealing with all of those counties. So at the local level, there's a greater connection um, to that, um, those uh, landowners, to that partnership, to the really even the atmosphere uh, of the local community. Um, so that's huge when you talk about the watershed association or, or really in uh, a watershed district. There could be a lake improvement district. There could be number of things. So um, their role helps with education, getting the information out to the affected lake, um, to setting up meeting places, um, to the county um, uh, permissions for disposal site um, if need be, if it, it, depending on which road it is, you know, if we need permissions along the right-of-way um, to do any work or have any heavy um, equipment. So the the activities going on, you know, there's a mm -hmm. lot of different roles that someone could fill. And it might not be the DNR taking the lead, and maybe it, it has to be the county on a project taking the lead. But there's always the DNR expertise um, role in there. Um, the surveying um, that would go on ahead of time um, would always be there, and any other help to that nature. Fair to say, then, you're also always relying on the public and property owners to keep their eyes open. Oh, and, and I... Um, preach that, if you will, uh, and promote that any time I talk to a lake association, because I am only two eyes, I am only one set, and I am only one of me, and I can't be everywhere at once. So the more eyes I have looking, and it only takes one inkling of suspicion and a report, and I can usually identify things off a picture because I'm so familiar with our natives and our invasives. So sometimes something that might not jump out to somebody, um, but a key feature of a native, you know, and I can rule out any invasive. So it just takes a picture. You'd be amazed at the number of reports that come in that are from um, young children swimming along public beaches or walking looking for shells, and that's amazing. So when I'm um, at elementary schools, I really preach. I say, you know, you can help me do my job. And they get all excited. How? Um, so I spend time showing them the look pictures for this. So yes, every everybody out there can help stop. Awesome. So I now use the term um, or the phrase "spread the word, not the species." Okay. Um, just getting that word out there. Actually, being aware of the issue it helps tremendously. Well, I want to thank you for joining us, Nicole, and providing all the information that you have. On the bottom of the screen, you'll see a link to the DNR's website on aquative, aquative invasive species, and you can get some more information there as well. Thank you for joining me. Please join me next time on Lake Link Currents.